Caucasus. And in the south, you have some of the uh, Yemenite, the Temanim. Uh, so this gives a very broad but diverse picture that we have a tremendous amount of diversity in the Jewish communities here. So under the Ottoman laws, the uh, Jews were al-kitab, al uh, people of the book, uh, meaning that they were an Abrahamic religion. And thus, e even though they were not followers of Muhammad, uh, the prophet, that they were like a uh, crazy older brother who, uh, you know, they had to, you know, say, okay, you're my brother, but um, you have to be put off to the side now. Um, so as the status, Jews were allowed to manage their own affairs as long as the chisya tax was paid. Chisya um, comes out of, again, this, uh, um, it, this is out of Islamic law, the al-Kitab. Um, the chisya, it was a poll tax um, that was collected yearly. Um, that was, you know, uh, the Jews and the Christians uh, all paid it um, or were supposed to pay it. Some years it was very onerous, others it wasn't. It was very dependent on um, who was the local authority in power or the sultan, uh, what they had. Some sultans were far friendlier. Uh, other uh, sultans were a lot, uh, didn't have any interest in provincial affairs. And so you had local uh, uh, governing officials that took advantage of this. Um, and we see this in many letters and especially uh, Considering the Jewish community in Jerusalem, there was uh, several uh, unscrupulous uh, pashas who extorted the Jewish community and also the Christian community as well. Um, so as part of this affair, um, the communities kept their own registers and archives. Um, but as we know, historically, most of these registers and archives did not survive due to mainly uh, fires, but also earthquakes, wars, sometimes stuff just fell apart. Um, it's what we always know. So, uh, the different archives that do exist in many ways, which I'll go over today. Um, so the various community archives, there's the Ottoman archives, um, the community archives that are still in place in the community, for example, Istanbul, the office of Haham uh, the community archives that were in other countries, for example, the Central Archives for the History of the Jewish People um, in Moscow, Yad Ben Tzvi, um, cemeteries that still exist or that were recorded or that the Evitas were recorded, uh, secondary archives such as the Alliance Israelite uh, Universelle in Paris, um, and the diplomatic archives of Italy, France, Netherlands, England. Uh, there's manuscripts all over the globe, many digitized already in the Kativ project of the National Library. Um, there's rabbinic books that have been published and are easily accessible uh, online as PDFs, um, just in usually very inaccessible print or in very poor quality print. Um, there's familial archives that um, exist that is wholly dependent on knowing the family. And then there's other routes. So, the Ottoman archives. Um, the Ottoman archives are essentially inaccessible outside of the country. Um, the documents are mostly in Ottoman Turkish. Uh, typically names are rendered as name, son of father, even though Jews did have surnames. Um, these surnames in the Jewish community do show up randomly uh, until the late 19th century. I know example from Aleppo from the 16th century of one of these tax registers where the names of the families were actually recorded, uh, but it was wholly up to whomever, whatever official was reporting. Uh, what we have to the left is a page from one of these uh, tax registers from the 18th century in Izmir. Um, and these are all without surname. This is just son, father. Um, and it's written in Ottoman Turkish. Um, so, but other documents that exist are tax registers, community disputes, notables mentioned. There's a whole, essentially, I had to be, you know, sort of tongue in cheek about, but there's a whole untapped potential here. Um, but it requires a very specialized research and quite frankly, to be in Turkey um, because the archives still haven't uh, 
even though they say they're accessible, um, if you try to register from abroad using their system, you can never actually complete the registration. So community archives in place. Um, for most of these Ottoman Jewish communities, uh, the archives in place are mainly from the late 19th century and 20th century. And accessibility is a community by community basis. So uh, some of you here might be familiar with uh, in the 2000s, uh, Dan Kazez was, um, did a whole project indexing and databasing um, these records for the Istanbul Jewish community, but Turkish privacy laws essentially took it down. Um, and so you can only access these today by writing to the uh, community itself. And having done it myself, you can get an answer sometimes six months later and sometimes you'll never get an answer. So it's uh, a very, you know, difficult and community by community proposition. Um, community archives that are in other countries. So almost all the archives of these communities are no longer in C2, meaning that they're no longer in the community or in the place of the community. Um, the Central Archives of the History of Jewish People in Jerusalem has most of these archives in part or in full. Um, in Europe, especially, some of the archives were taken as war booty, um, such as those taken to Moscow. Um, this, for those of you who are familiar with the story of the Salonika Jewish Community Archive, you'll know the work that uh, Devin Nard did on it, um, and that there's still parts of the archive that are being held by the Russians. Um, as part, uh, since they were the ones who came into uh, uh, Salonika and Macedonia and conquered it from the Nazis. Uh, and as a result, the accessibility varies by location. The ones in Jerusalem, all you need to do is fill out a form, um, say who you are, what your interest is, um, and just set a time to go there because a lot of these um, are in, are held in storage uh, in climate controlled storage offsite. So you have to reserve it at least a couple of days in advance for them to bring out everything. Having done it before, this is a picture I took of one of the surviving census registers of Salonika that is held in the archive. Um, you can see the beautiful Ottoman Turkish form at the top. The, uh, I don't know if you can really see the handwriting, but the handwriting's in Solotreo and Eastern Sephardic script, which also has its own set of issues such as you have to, it's not easy uh, for somebody who knows Hebrew to suddenly come in because it's a completely different cursive um, and not so many people are familiar with it. Uh, there's the cemeteries. Uh, again, the accessibility varies by location. Um, there's books like uh, Matzevot Saloniki, um, which for the Salonika Jewish community are vital. Um, there's manuscripts listing epitaphs from communities all over um, sometimes we don't even know which uh, community they came from, just that they were somewhere in that area. Um, and then there's also databases like Mina Rosen's uh, uh, recently published uh, A World Beyond Jewish Cemeteries in Turkey, um, which has 60,000 stones or fragments um, stretching from the late 16th century until the uh, late 20th century. So there are secondary archives like the Alliances or the Universal Archive, um, which are gold mines for hundreds of these communities. Um, the Alliance was very interested in the affairs of local Jewish communities. And not only will you find lists of students, but sometimes you will see um, the professor or the principals reporting on, you know, who are, who's here in the community conducting almost like a census. Um, itself, because uh, the Alliance also was a global Jewish organization, and they not only were interested in education, but also in directing uh, aid in many ways in Jewish communities. So they needed to know what was going on. Um, there's also diplomatic archives, which re uh, reveal a wealth of information if they survive um, for Jews who held foreign citizenship. Um, many Ottoman Jews, um, in order to not pay the poll tax, uh, the Chisia um, would obtain or have already a European citizenship, thus protecting them from having to pay. Um, these uh, uh, Jews were known as the Francos, um, which is uh, referring to France, Franks, but actually just means uh, European Jews. Um, not everybody was actually um, European, uh, but 
uh, quite a few families ended up obtaining this protection as a, um, because they were powerful merchants and the, uh, and the countries had an interest, shall we say, in having them under their protection, patronage. Um, it, there's a whole bunch, especially the Italians and the French, but also Netherlands, um, German, English, um, but the most famous ones being the Italian and the French. So manuscripts, there's thousands of manuscripts that are scattered across the globe. Many have not even been cataloged as they exist in the auction private collection market. Um, many of those in libraries and archives may already be digitized as part of the Katif project. And these manuscripts can include unpublished books, circumcisions, marriage and divorce registers, letters, fragments of community archives, um, histories. I, there's just a tremendous amount uh, here. Uh, but again, it's all uh, very typically in uh, a, a script that's not as easy to deal with. Um, in this case on the left, the script is, um, which is known as uh, Mizrahi or uh, the Mizrahi script. Um, it's not quite Solitreo, but it's also not quite Rashi script. Um, it's a little easier to read, but it's uh, sort of an in-between. Now there's also uh, rabbinic books, uh, hundreds of published books of Ottoman Jewish hachamim. Uh, many of these books deal with halakha and religious matters. Uh, oftentimes they also have sermons detailing family relations particularly on deaths, marriages, disputes, questions arising between community members and divorce registers. Um, the one on the left is from uh, Shalomo Amarillo's book, uh, Pane Shalomo. Um, and he says that this is the sermon I gave in the uh, Kahal uh, Etz Chaim um, in the 16th, uh, I don't remember the exact day, I don't have it in front of me, um, in 1660s um, about his grandmother-in-law who just passed away, her name was Sol. We don't know her family name. Um, now, introductions can also include author's genealogy as well, or um, other members who contributed to the book, uh, uh, sponsored its printing. This is not too uncommon to see. And some families have archives which have survived through descendants. My family's example has a photographic archive that has been preserved by uh, descendants all over the globe. Um, some of these uh, photographs and art pieces have information about family members. Um, for example, my grandfather's first cousin did a uh, painting of uh, her grandfather, uh, her great grandfather, um, I'm sorry, my uh, great-grandmother's first cousin did a painting of her uh, grandfather and included the name of his father um, on this, which we didn't know before, but suspected. Um, there's also family trees uh, and documents. Um, like I mentioned, some of these uh, Nefus papers, these population registry extracts, I've seen in private uh, families, some of these gorgeous family trees that have been kept within the family for you know, three, 400 years. Um, but it's very dependent on the family and the circumstances of their lives over the years. Other routes. Um, there are other archives of the modern Ottoman successor states like Greece, Serbia, um, Israel, uh, that all are accessible and can provide documentation, um, especially as we get to the, when those states are founded, but there's also uh, older materials from the Ottoman period that they may have. Uh, the Greek archives, for example, have, uh, and some of the oldest archives, some notary registers and everything of the uh, Sharia court, which was also the notary, which was also a civil court in the Ottoman Empire. Um, archives in other countries where Ottoman Jews traveled, for example, Amsterdam, The Hague, uh, United Kingdom, Venice, Tuscany, Roma, and Kona, uh, Dubrovnik, Ragusa, North South America, Australia, all over the world, there's bits and pieces and DNA testing. So now how do we put this into action? 
Today, I'll be presenting you a couple of case studies from my own family research. So my great-grandparents, Isaac Raby and Rebecca Angel, um, they got married in New York. They had two marriage certificates. Uh, one was uh, done in front of the city alderman, the city clerk, a few months prior to their uh, religious. Um, and interestingly for genealogy, on the first one on the left, my great-grandfather Isaac's first cousin, Haim Becha, is one of the witnesses. And on the marriage certificate on the left, which was done in the Spanish and uh, Portuguese sisterhood um, by Rabbi uh, Aaron Ben Ezra, um, my great-grandmother Rebecca's first cousin, Jacques Kabili, signs as the witness on this one. So this is an example of looking at, oh, we have, you know, to uh, uh, family members on the marriage certificates, the civil. Um, and they also provide wealth of data. Um, we have the names of the parents, even though on my great grandfather, he Americanized to Jacob and Suzanne Merle, uh, Jacob Raby and Suzanne Merle. Um, and whereas my great grandmother stuck with her uh, parents' names, uh, Moise uh, Angel and Mazeltov Mijan. Um, but interestingly on both, uh, my great-grandmother can't decide if she was born in Larissa or Salonika. There's a reason for that. So on the Rebbe side, um, here is a family tree that's been documented with records with basically everything possible. Um, and th these are all confirmed ancestors. Um, the one question is, at the name of uh, Sarota Sarfati, if her family was actually Sarfati, but that's one of the few questions we have, but that comes from a, a death certificate that unfortunately I don't have scanned, but is sitting in Miami, um, in my mother's home. So for my great grandfather, this is the uh, census of the Izmir Jewish community in 1895. He's actually underlined um, what you see is a uh, son, uh, his name is Yitzchak, um, the son of Yaakov. Um, he was born in the Muslim year uh, 1307, which corresponds to 1889. And he was born on the 25th of Elul or registered on the 25th of Elul uh, in the year 1307, um, 1889. Um, this actually is great. And I realize after looking at this uh, years later that this was actually his birth date because everywhere else he gives his birth date as September 25th, 1889, which is uh, 25th of Elul, 1307 on the same day. Uh, whereas for all of his siblings and his parents, they all got registered seven years early or except for um, one of his older sisters. Um, as you can see, everybody before born before the year 300, uh, 1300, uh, was registered on the same day. And then everybody born afterwards was registered on the date of their birth. Uh, and this also gives his parents' his names, uh, Yaakov Rebbe, son of Avraham. He's a hacham, uh, that's his occupation. And there's uh, Sultana, uh, his wife, a uh, daughter of Ilya. Um, and then I mentioned uh, the diplomatic archives. What I have below is an extract of a letter I received from the Italian consulate in Izmir uh, listing my great-great-grandparents on the uh, Italian citizenship register. Of, uh, and those uh, for Izmir exist from 1871 because in 1871, there was a fire destroying the previous years. But some of these registers contain people who were born in the 18th century. Um, so it says, uh, uh, Giacobbe Rebi, son of Abramo uh, Rebi and Sarah Davidas. Uh, born in Izmir in 1849, uh, and his origin is Livorno, which is how he had Italian citizenship. Uh, his wife is Sultana Moron, born in Izmir in 1850, and they have one son here, their son uh, Avram, who was born in Izmir in 1884. All this corresponds to everything we have. Um, this was because Avram was actually working for the uh, Banca di Roma um, in Izmir. So uh, this registration was made at the time uh, for his uh, professional purposes. Uh, here's some records from different places. On the left is what I, is a record for my great great grandmother Sultana Maron's uh, brother Yusuf. Um, this is the so in 
1923, when the Greeks uh, uh, lose Izmir uh, to Ataturk. Um, there's the great fire of the city, uh, including in this fire, um, the Ottoman Nefus registers were burned for the city. So um, this is in 1924, Joseph went back to um, basically recreate his archival document. Uh, and so this is the extract from the register. This was in order to get a visa to come to the United States uh, in 1929, where he, uh, which he did with his wife and he died in New York in 31. Um, and so the left are, and it gives his parents' his names as Ilya Moron and Sarota. Um, and to the right are two sisters of Yosef and Sultana, uh, Rebecca and uh, Rachel, who moved to Brazil. Uh, with their husbands and their uh, families. And this is their death uh, registers, uh, death certificates uh, from Brazil. And again, Elia Moron and Sarah or Sorota uh, as the parent. Now here I mentioned cemeteries. So these are on the far left is my great great grandmother, uh, Sultana Moron. Uh, her grave in Izmir grew Um This was documented as part of Medina Roseanne's project. Uh, it gives her date of death. Um, it says that her mother was Sarota, um, which interestingly enough in the Eastern Sephardic tradition at this time, um, you see the names of the mothers mainly on tombstones. Um, so in the middle is her husband, Yaakov Rebbe. It says that he's a Chazan, which we know or which we knew that he's quite elderly, he's a hacham, um, and that he was the son of Sarah. Uh, turns out full name is Belisa Sarah. The siblings sometimes use both names. Otherwise, and it gives the date of death, they both died in 1933. And to the right of that is the epitaph of Yaakov's mother. Uh, Belisa, uh, her name was Sarah uh, and she was called Belisa. Um, and she was the daughter of Mazel Tov Reina. Um, and as we know from one of my cousin's private collections, um, her, her maiden name was Rebi. Uh, this was Bulisa Sarah Davidas, uh, um, who married to Abraham Yitzchak uh, Rebi, who had predeceased her. And that Abraham was also a Chazan, uh, like his son Yaakov. And okay, so to go jump to different kinds of records. On the top right is the um, marriage uh, registration or really the record for the synagogue, for the Orahim synagogue in Izmir of my great, great grandparents' uh, uh, wedding, including what the dowry consisted of, which was um, more than 24,000 Ottoman Grush. It was quite a substantial uh, dowry. They were a very wealthy family. Um, the Orahim, uh, synagogue, also known as the Forasteros uh, Synagogue. Um, uh, Sultana, her father's family belonged to the, the uh, Portuguese synagogue um, in Izmir. Um, so you see, uh, you can find out a lot of information this way on these registers. They exist in very good detail um, throughout the 19th, uh, basically from the mid 19th century forward, uh, Dov Cohen, uh, who assisted me with the research uh, uh, he has done a lot with these uh, documents, including publishing his index of these uh, registers. Um, so um, there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces here for genealogy. Um, and then uh, to the, uh, the other three come from different rabbinic books. Um, they all give information on uh, different members of the family. So the top left, uh, was written by uh, uh, the Hacham Bashi of Izmir, Abraham Palache, um, where he discusses in 1833 um, about his uh, uh, cousins, un we don't know her name, the daughter of his uncle, uh, the gentleman uh, Raphael Rebi, who was the father of Abraham Yitzhak Rebi um, and who is still alive. Uh, uh, who married with uh, uh, Israel, son of the very famous Hacham Bashi, uh, uh, Rafael, Parde, uh, uh, Rafael uh, Pinchas de Segura, who ends up 
moving to Eretz Israel and the last days of his life and is buried here. Uh, and to the left, we have Abraham Palache again, writing a sermon about the death of his grandmother. Again, we don't know her name, but we know she was married to Yitzchak Rebbe, the father of Raphael, um, who also has already predeceased. And uh, she died in 1840 or 5600, in the Hebrew year 5600. Um, and to the right is Raphael uh, Pinchas de Segura's book, uh, Otle Yehoshua, where he talks about the same woman, the death of her, that she was the sister of his mother. But again, we don't know um, their names. We just know that they were sisters, um, that they shared parents. Um, but like much of the Jewish world, women's names don't always get remembered, unfortunately. But get remembered as the wife or daughter of so-and-so. And here is a document attesting to the earliest generation of the family, Yitzchak's father. At the top, uh, Yitzchak had a very wealthy brother uh, named Yaakov Rebbe, who all the other Yaakov Rebbe's in the family are named after. Um, he was a very wealthy merchant um, and he founded the, uh, a yeshiva, uh, a Talmud Torah in Izmir uh, called the Beit Yaakov Rebbe. Um, and on the bottom, we see his mother's name is listed as Zinbul, um, who had already predeceased at this point. Um, and at the top is actually a, a document from the Jerusalem Sephardic archives, uh, which is attesting to the will of Yaakov. And it mentions uh, uh, him as the uh, son of Pinchas. Um, who uh, predeceased. So, and now we get to go to a different angle, DNA. So, as I'm sure many of you here have heard ad nauseum from myself or from Adam Brown, who's on the call, uh, or Raquel Toledano, um, DNA offers a very interesting pathway for conducting research. Um, I'll start on the right first since that's the simplest. Uh, mitochondrial DNA, which again, overview, is what passes from uh, mother, mother to child in an unbroken line. So it gives us a direct window into a single ancestor. Um, and interestingly, so I had tested a member of uh, my mother's family who represented the mitochondrial lineage of my great-great-grandmother Sultana. And her results came back and it was a very Southeastern European mitochondrial DNA haplogroup, meaning that uh, my ancestress at some point in the past 500 years was a convert from likely Christianity into uh, the Jewish community. Um, there was also a woman who descended from the Barrow family of Rhodos, um, who also matched the same haplogroup. So we likely share this ancestor. We don't know her name, but we know she belonged to H1AN2, which is a relatively rare uh, Southeast European haplogroup. On the flip side, Y-DNA, um, which uh, passes from father to son in an unbroken line. Um, this uh, mutates a whole lot faster um, we can do very accurate dating as a result of it. So what you see here is a family tree created on the basis of so far three different uh, fully sequenced Y-DNA kits. So on the left, um, we have my uh, de descendant of my third, uh, fourth great grandfather, Raphael Rebbe, who tested. And on the right, we have a descendant of Raphael's older brother, Yaakov Rebbe. Uh, who tested. So we're talking about a two, 300, uh, 250 year difference between uh, the two testees. Um, so we know, confirmed that their father, Yitzhak Revy, belongs to this lineage GFGC56986. The numbering doesn't matter. It's just a cataloging number, but this is the significant uh, mutation that marks all the descendants of this man. Um, and on the other side, we have a uh, uh, old, an earlier split with a line that remained uh, Persian Jews, um, mainly leaving descendants in the Afghani Jewish community and the Mashadi Jewish community. Um, 
And so uh, with these three tests, we can actually say that in all likelihood, this ancestor represented by this SNP uh, G030, uh, GZ30721 uh, was likely alive in the late 16th century, which would fit uh, the entire story because um, some of you may be aware that when the Medicis uh, made their decree in fighting everybody to come to the newly founded city of Livorno to, and they got citizenship, it didn't matter what their background was. The Medicis also published it in Persian among the 15 languages they wrote it in. So what likely occurred here is the decree is the last half of this uh, last decade, a couple of decades of the 16th century. One, one brother representing my uh, uh, Rebbe family lineage left Persia and went west to Livorno to obtain the citizenship. And then uh, a couple generations later moves to Izmir. Um, and then the others represent the brothers who stayed, the brother who stayed behind in Persia. Uh, so this offers um, a very interesting look into helping establish the genealogies, even if we don't necessarily have the name for these people, but we do know they existed because they left a genetic imprint. Now I'm flipping to the other side of my family of uh, my great grandmother's family, which is a quite a bit deeper genealogically speaking. Um, on her father's side, we can trace back to the 16th century in Salonica. So this side gets into a lot more about manuscripts um, and other registers that are not typical. Um, so again, some of you may have seen this slide before. This is on the far right is a portrait of my great, great, great grandfather, David Angel, the Hachem Bashi of Larissa and Komotini in Greece. Um, this has been passed down through my family since the 1870s um, when it was taken in Sarajevo. Um, my great grandmother wrote at the top in pen uh, that uh, a little bit of biographical information. David Angel gave approximate years of birth and death, which were actually not too far off from the actuality from the uh, family uh, Amarillo, and she wrote grand rabbi and writer of books. Um, and so in the middle is his signature, um, which is in Soltreo. It might look to you like Arabic. Uh, that's for good reason because it was heavily influenced by Arabic script, the Arabic calligraphy. And on the left is the uh, title page to one of his surviving manuscripts, uh, Bayelakat David, which I had the opportunity to hold in my hands in Jerusalem at uh, Ben Svi Institute. So this manuscript um, gives, um, at the first volume of it actually has a lot of genealogical information in it, um, including he left this very wonderful list at the back of the book um, above it, he mentions when he got married. Um, for many of the audience, you think, oh, um, at that time, they must have gotten married when, you know, he was, you know, maybe 18, 20, maybe she was 17, 16. Well, not to shock you, but uh, he was 13 when he got married, and she was 12 and a half when she got married. Uh, this was actually very common in the Ottoman Jewish community especially for families from uh, Salonika, but um, it was a way to um, protect against the uh, eventuality of the parents dying young. They knew that they had somebody who would take care of their child should something go wrong. Um, and this was hugely common in the Ottoman Empire. Um, so they got married then they actually didn't have any children until they were into their 20s. Um, so you may breathe a sigh of relief, um, but this uh, list here gives the exact, uh, not only the day of the week, so we can know for sure, but also uh, the exact day that all of his children uh, were born. Um, and the uh, third name on there is my great great grandfather, uh, Moshe Angel, um, who was born in October of 1848. And there was uh, six uh, sisters, uh, uh, one of whom actually came to the United States. 
And so from her, we were actually able to confirm uh, their mother's name initially as Gracia, uh, Gracia Amarillo, who was the daughter of the Hacham Bashi of Larry San Corfu, Shentov Amarillo. Um, and here's something that uh, all of us Amsterdam researchers will quite appreciate. When I mentioned different archives having pieces of a story, on the right is a document from uh, the archive in Yad Ben Svi. It mentions that uh, my ancestor, David Angel, um, traveled to Amsterdam in 1858 to, and also throughout Europe to collect uh, money to help rebuild the synagogue, which had been destroyed in a uh, fire. Um, and on the left is actually it, from the Portuguese archive in Amsterdam, detailing his visit and how much money the Parnassim gave him towards his journey, as well as a letter that he was able to use to continue on his way. Um, so you can see, you know, this is several hundred, you know, this is, I guess, Amsterdam from Larissa's uh, thousand miles, at least something, a couple thousand kilometers, uh, very mobile. These people were getting around. So again, going back to manuscripts, we have, uh, even though the gravestone doesn't exist today, um, as far as we know, um, we have uh, from the uh, record, uh, all of these come from uh, the uh, chief rabbi uh, Moish Pesach, who is of Volo and later of Greece, um, who was instrumental in not only, you know, helping the Jews of Volo survive the Nazis, uh, but also in preserving as much of the community archive and history as possible, which is tremendous because a lot of this got destroyed. Uh, both with the rise of the Greek state and modernization, as well as just the Nazis and the communities in that time, a lot of them destroyed their archives in order to try and protect the uh, families, leaving only bits and pieces. So on the left, we have uh, him copying down the epitaph of my great-great-grandfather, Moshe Angel, who died in 1918. Um, at the bottom right, we have uh, one of the drafts of the epitaphs he wrote for Moshe's father, my great 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 grandfather, David Angel, which I found in his uh, manuscript, which he very clearly intended to publish, and hopefully we can publish it someday. But he wrote a whole history of the Jewish community in Larissa. And this was among it um, because uh, he was not only interested in the you know epitaphs, he actually collected must be a couple thousand epitaphs um, that we know about um, over time. Um, and he was uh, commissioned to write these epitaphs too, but he actually, this is among his many drafts of the epitaph he eventually created for my great, great, great grandfather, which gives us his uh, date of death and this beautiful uh, line at the bottom uh, that you know calls him uh, David uh, Malka Israel. Uh, David, King of Israel, you know, which to give actually um, the whole uh, story of the year and date, which I find to be beautiful. In a separate manuscript, um, he also has a whole register of deaths. And this is where we actually learn the names of not only uh, David Angel's mother, uh, who was uh, uh, Luna, uh, and this corresponds to the date of death. But we also see uh, above that is the register for David's wife. It says, Madre de Moshe David Angel, Gracia Bat uh, Simcha. So we know her name was Simcha, which again, this all corresponds uh, to the names of the children. Uh, the two eldest daughters, one was Simcha, the other was Luna Sara. And that we know from uh, my great grandmother's first cousin, um, uh, or niece, sorry, um, that uh, David Angel's father was Moshe, which corresponds to Moshe, which corresponds to my great great grandfather, Moise. Now, here is uh, when I mentioned manuscripts that have gone into the uh, auction private collection world. Um, this was from a luckily. The library had a uh, microfilmed it years prior, but um, the Montefiore Library in England 
um, for whatever reason, years ago, sold off a bunch of their manuscripts to help raise funds. And this was one of the victims. Um, and this talks, uh, this is uh, um, a description of uh, Shantov Amarillo, the father-in-law of David, the father of Gracia. Um, uh, he had respond, uh, corresponded with um, uh, Hacham in Italy, uh, Garondi, uh, who uh, then gave a brief uh, description about him. And it says that he was the uh, uh, descendant of uh, uh, the rabbis of Salanka, the writers of the books uh, Kerem Shalomo uh, and Devar Moshe. Um, so Shalomo Amario and Chaim Moshe Amario. Um, and from what I can understand, it's likely that Chaim Moshe was his grandfather, but still haven't found out uh, Shemtov's father's name or mother's name for that matter. And to give you even you know, deeper history, uh, in Salonika, the families, um, even though the archives there really only extend into the late 19th and early 20th century with a very um, uh, high quality in terms of con uh, conclusively knowing who is who, um, what, what has survived thanks to the efforts of the uh, uh, Hacham uh, historians, uh, Michael Mojo, Eitzchak Emanuel, um, they copy down the, basically the family registers of all the kahals of uh, Salonika. Um, and these kahals correspond almost exclusively to points of origin of the family. Um, and this is where I find it's a really cool part of my oral history that my late great uncle, um, when I first started out on this path, told me the oral history of the family. He said, my father's family is from Livorno, which as we discovered, uh, we have documentation of, just not in Livorno yet, because it was probably too early, unfortunately. And they said, my mother's family, uh, her father was from Southern Italy and her mother was from Sicily. And so, um, at the top is the register of the Sicilia Yashan uh, Synagogue, the Gal um, in Salonika, um, her mother Mijan, and here's Mijan on the register. So we know here's 500 years of world history. Um, on the left, we have um, the Angel family. They were first uh, members of the Otranto and Puglia uh, Gals, which were, of course, Otranto and Puglia is Southern Italy, the heel of the boot. Um, they also later joined the Italia Shalom, which contained families from all over Italy, and Chiana, which was uh, basically created by a breakaway group of the Puglia, the Calabria, and a couple other synagogues. Um, because, you know, there's always the joke that, you know, uh, if, you're, uh, if a Jew is uh, stuck on a deserted island, he builds two synagogues, one he prays in, the other one he'll never step foot in. And so we see this kind of splintering happening. Um, and on the left, we have the Amarillo family, uh, which we didn't have an oral history of, but um, we know they were members of Eta Hayim, uh, which Eta Hayim is uh, all over the Ottoman Empire, refers to the Romaniot synagogues. But in this case, it refers to the fact that this was uh, the synagogue of the Romaniot community uh, uh, in Salonika. But when uh, Mehmed II uh, uh, conquers Constantinople, um, he brings all the Jews from the empire into Constantinople and thus create uh, almost all of them are Romaniot, some of them Ashkenazi. Um, so the synagogue was still empty when the refugees first arrived, so it became part of the Sephardic community, um, which actually brings me back now that I reminded myself why by uh, Mohammed II is important for genealogy because Istanbul actually is really a Sephardized Romaniote community. Um, it's only in the late 17th, early 18th century, according to the tax documents, that the Sephardic uh, families eventually outnumbered uh, the Romaniote families after they integrated. Um, and so we have a very Sephardized Romaniote community. Um, and now the other community, uh, the Yahya Liviaten was another one of these breakaway synagogues. But interestingly, the Evera synagogue is one of the 
synagogues of the Portuguese new Christian community that settled in Salonica um, and the Amarillo family. Um, we know from the uh, Portuguese archives that they were in Portugal at the time of the forced conversion. So we don't know who it was, but they were very early immigrants into um, Salonica from Portugal. Um, there's uh, leaders in uh, Hachlamim from this family as early as the first half of the 16th century known about in Salonica. Um, so that concludes um, my presentation. Um, here is uh, my contact information. Um, and yes, I open the floor back up to Ton and David. Thank, thank you. That was that was absolutely incredible. It was just, yeah, I mean, like hundreds, hundreds of years condensed. Can I, um, first of all, just start by by um, welcoming everyone who's also joining us on um, uh, Facebook, uh, including sort of Luca and Gina and Ian and everybody else. And if anybody on Facebook has any questions, if you just type them in there, we can put them to uh, Michael. Can I, can I, um, ask two questions, perhaps one at, at, at each end. The traditional story we have is that the Sephardim arrive in the Ottoman Empire and because of their superior culture and everything else, they absorb everybody else. Um, it, you know, is, is there any truth in that beyond perhaps Minhag? And secondly, at the other end, you um, you, you, you gave a history and you sort of stopped it around 1900. And what, what I wanted to know was whether the Young Turk revolutions and especially the conscription laws in sort of 1908, 1909 was the main impetus for, uh, especially of course, Jewish men to, to move to Western Europe and to North America. Okay. So the first question, it's actually really, quite frankly, a myth. Yeah. Um, the reason why this is actually the first time in Jewish history where um, the Minha uh, Gamakom did not come into play because when the Sephardic refugees first arrived to many of the uh, places in the empire, especially Salonika, uh, the city is empty. Um, there's no there's no Romania community to speak of. There's no local community to speak of. They had been, um, you know, removed. There was a small Ashkenazi community, but it wasn't, uh, while it becomes very important in the history of Sri Lanka, um, it itself wasn't, you know, established enough to be Minhaka Makom. So eventually the Sephardic community just population-wise overwhelms it. Um, I mentioned Istanbul. Um, so we actually have very interesting, um, halakhic disputes between Istanbul and the other areas of the empire because the Istanbul uh, community was ruling using Romani oat uh, minhag um, primarily. So the, even though there's a Sephardic halakha there, it's um, infused with the preceding Romani oat, which can have a, a stricter um, uh, regulation in many senses, especially regarding marriage, as um, there's some fame, uh, quite interesting disputes in the 16th century where a man goes to Istanbul from Salonika. Um, and then there's a dispute over whether he's actually did the Kiddushin and everything and is married or is not married. Are they engaged? All be, owing to this dispute between um, which uh, uh, was influenced. And we see this also in the way um, the tombstones are, are using descriptors. The Romani Oats were very strict on following Pirkei Avot, the uh, things our forefathers for constructing the ages, what, um, wh what stage of life somebody was, uh, how you became, who was a Bahur, who was a Talmid, who was a Nara, who was a, a Yelda, a Zikna, um, so on and so forth. Um, to go to your other question, uh, in terms of, I, I stopped there because um, to get into all the different successor states, what goes yeah. on after that gets yeah. very complicated very quickly, um, especially because we're dealing also with um, a sudden explosion of the European colonial infrastructure 
throughout the former lands of the empire, um, which at that point had really only been in North Africa and under uh, sort of surreptitiously, but not really um, elsewhere throughout the empire. Um, but this is where administration suddenly flip. We have a whole, you know, uh, there's a whole uh, 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 monumental changes that occur. Um, now regarding the movement of Ottoman of men, you know, I have never seen that as really a reason. I know every so often we come across an oral history that says, oh, my family left because of it. Uh, no, not really. The Ottoman Jews were very, uh, un, you know, we talk about, you know, at this point in the 20th century about Zionism, the rise of Zionism. Um, the Ottoman Jews were very non-Zionist. They were very committed Ottomanists uh, to the very end. Um, of course, some, you know, some do leave because of it. Some are Zionists, um, but they're really isn't that kind of dialectic going on. Um, and so uh, even my, one of my uh, great grandfather's younger siblings, uh, Yosef, um, we only know about from oral history, but uh, he was drafted and he apparently died in Gallipoli. Um, but we don't have a lot of military, there's, I can't think of really any military records like we think of in the United States with draft registration or in the UK or France or any of these countries because um, these army, a national civil army was a basically a late term construction and was very hastily put together to respond to first the uh, collapse of the Ottoman Empire in Southeast Europe and then two years later, the uh, World War I. Okay, th thank you. There's, there's a question from Frances. Um, she, she was asking how, how they lived. Perhaps we can sort of narrow that down to perhaps sort of late Ottoman Salonika. Um, I mean, were they the sort of all classes, the working classes, the merchant classes or specific professions or? Uh, sorry, uh, you... what do you mean by the Frances? Uh, uh, Frances, she's a member of uh, our, oh. our, our, our group. She's, she's just asking how, how, how people lived, how they made their living. Oh. They did. Uh, I mean, if we're just using Slanka as an example, the vast majority of Jews were poor, you know, peddlers, essentially. Yeah. Um, but in uh, Salonika, they were uh, extremely famous for uh, port, uh, their port working. Um, the port did not work on the Sabbath. Um, basically, for the entire Ottoman Empire, it's only with the population exchange that the port suddenly starts working on Saturdays and not Sundays. Um, but the port, uh, port workers in Sanka were famous, uh, uh, tobacco industry, um, real, there was, you know, they had real estate slumlords. Um, I don't remember the name of the researcher, but I was in a, uh, a workshop several years ago about Sanka and they were doing research on the property records, which up until the mid 19th century, all property in the empire could not be privately owned. It was property of the Sultan. Yeah. Um, most of the time, the pri any private property was overlooked because it wasn't, you know, uh, you know, that good, you know, that extravagant. But in the, after the Tanzimat land reform, then you start seeing uh, private uh, building owners explosion of development. Um, and you see um, Jewish and Sabbatean families uh, primarily owning a lot of what we would call essentially slum lords um, in Salonika. Um, yeah. We see that uh, they were engaged in global uh, mercantile networks. They, uh, they had, uh, I would say, the vast majority um, were in the lower or impoverished classes um, and lived very, I hate to say basic, but not extravagant lifestyles. Then you had a, sm a relatively small middle class and an even smaller elite. Um, the elite um, could be quite wealthy. Um, my uh, great grandfather's family had a, lived in the Karatash district, which was the uh, wealthy Jewish district of Izmir. Um, they had a, their own cortejo, a family mansion where they had their own private synagogue uh, as well. So just to give you 
a sense on the other end of the spectrum. Of, uh, could you, sorry, could you um, switch off your um, screen share so that we can see yeah. the bigger screen? Great, Todd, Todd. Yes, uh, um, you mentioned the census of 1831. Are we able to get a rough estimate of how many Jews there lived in the Ottoman Empire at the time? Um, I don't have it in front of me. Um, I would have to double check and get back to you on that. Um, yeah. The census okay. in 1831 only was male heads of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, but the later censuses, which again, the censuses may or may not survive. Uh, it's dependent on what copies did or if there's any damage to them. Um, but um, they were carried out over the empire. It really comes standardized towards uh, in Abdul Hamid II's um, reign. Um, and that's where you really start to see true civil registration and a true counting of all the individuals of the empire. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, that those communities had auton autonomy. They could raise their own taxes. Could they also uh, punish their members, uh, find them, put a harem, harem on them? Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, no, they, that was actually, the Ottomans didn't really want to have to deal with policing. Um, they, they were very hands off. They were not a, in the business of micromanaging. Um, so they actually preferred um, for stuff like that um, to, uh, for the communities to take care of it, but they were also quite happy if the um, if the community of the Christian and Jewish communities went to um, the Sharia court instead, because that usually meant more money <laughs> coming in, mm -hmm. uh, and also sort of as a like, oh, we're better than you know you. Um, mm -hmm. The funny thing about the Sharia courts was people went to them to get favorable decisions in all facts, because if you got there first, you could bribe the uh, court judge. Um, and so, and you would also get a judgment the same day or shortly thereafter, whereas with a Beit Din or a canonical court for the Christians, it could take, it could be a process involving, you know, there's a, a famous court case, which is still, or not court case, but a halachic case, um, beginning in Corfu, um, that lasted over a hundred years, um, okay. that is still studied, um, and my, Ancestor Shentova Maria was the first in the line of Hachamin to issue a ruling on it uh, regarding yeah. the status of Mamzer. Yeah. And if, if they did not get what they wanted from those uh, lawsuits or courts or from their communities, did they go to the Sharia courts? Oh, yeah. No, they would, you know, the it ended up being you would see communities going from one court to the other till they got what they wanted and then trying to <laughs> play it off. Um, there's a famous, uh, I did forget to mention, there's another Jewish community, the Kara'in, the Karaite community, mm. um, which um, was in, primarily in Istanbul, but also in Crimea and other parts in Egypt um, and Iraq, um, the, the Kara'in. There's a very interesting case from the 16th century where um, even though the Kara'in don't recognize rabbinic authority, um, they say the rabbis are not you know, uh, legal purveyors of the law. Uh, in a dispute over a will from the community, Kara'in decided to go to the Istanbul Beit Din, one of the Beit Dins in Istanbul, which is written about. Um, so you see this whole, you know, Everywhere we would go to where they could get the most favorable ruling. Yeah, there's an interesting question coming in, which I will translate as, uh, did uh, Jews ever had political influence? For example, when the empire was uh, uh, dissolved. Oh yeah, no, the, I mean, there's a very um, famous story, which uh, many, many of you may be familiar with, uh, the um, the Farhi family of Damascus. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, one of the sons, uh, the, the Farhis of Damascus, were a powerful banking family, um, and one of the sons was dispatched to uh, Akko 
in the late 18th century, Chaim Farhi, to serve as the fin uh, financial advisor and vizier of uh, Ahmad uh, al Jazar Pasha um, in the early 1780s. Mm -hmm. um, and he was an extremely powerful man. Um, he served Ahmad, he served Ahmad's stepson, Suleiman Pasha, and then Suleiman's uh, son, Abdullah Pasha, um, and who uh, Haim actually adopted uh, after Suleiman's death. And uh, while Abdullah Pasha was uh, the ruler of Akko, um, he was very young at the time, so Haim Farhi almost acted as a regent, like you would see in other monarchies or power situations. And so some of uh, Abdullah Pasha's advisors, uh, private advisors were telling him, why are you letting the Jew rule Akko? Uh, so Abdullah um, sent, dispatched uh, assassins, had Chaim strangled and thrown from the, the uh, seawall in Akko into the Mediterranean. And Chaim's uh, wife uh, fled uh, back to Damascus, uh, at one point is stopped in spot and that but continues on to her uh, journey. But this also you see throughout the empire, there's areas where uh, Jews attain fairly um, expansive political influence, um, not in any exceptional way, but as part of the Young Turks, there were Jews involved in the Young Turks. There were Sa uh, Sabbateans who were also, you know, Jews, but more complicated. Um, the, mm. uh, so we see, yeah, it's not a clear, you know, it's not a clear cut answer, but yes, Jews did. Yeah. Um, and even if they weren't in power, there was, you know, families had influence based off of any networking. So David, any questions on Facebook? Uh, yeah, first, first of all, just, just, just to follow up on, 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 uh, powerful, uh, Fahis. Uh, first of all, Alain Fahi is on, on this call, and also uh, Alain will be speaking to us in exactly uh, one month's uh, time. On uh, Facebook, we have uh, a question from uh, Luca. Um, in Italy, we have uh, census type lists in the uh, 16th, 17th and 18th centuries for many Jewish communities, mainly draw drawn for taxation purposes. Do such lists exist in the case of Salonika or other towns in the Ottoman Empire for the same centuries? Oh yeah, no, they. I showed you very early on yeah. a slide of the Chisia register. Now the Chisia register includes everybody who was supposed or by law had to pay uh, their tax. Uh, doesn't always include everybody because some people have foreign protection, others get around it. Um, but the, these registers do exist from the very beginning of the empire. The problem you run into is that most of them are just father's name, uh, son and father's name. Um, even though they all legally had surnames, but under Ottoman, uh, under Islamic law, surnames did not exist. Um, so you, you would have, you know, name, father's name, maybe a nickname. Um, but every so often, like in Aleppo, uh, Salonika, you'll sometimes come across um, these with the surnames of the people on them. You'll also um, uh, sometimes come across lists of uh, uh, the synagogues because that's how the communities would organize and pay their taxes. So sometimes you would get lucky with, you know, some families are members of uh, those synagogues for those periods. There's no consistent a uh, record of those that have survived because it's been, it's hundreds of years, some survived, some didn't, uh, but you can find them almost all in the Ottoman archives. Um, anything later, sometimes you'll find them in the uh, local archives as well, because there would sometimes be copies kept locally. Um, so in Greece, um, in Serbia, in uh, Bulgaria, uh, Macedonia, Albania, uh, Bosnia, uh, you'll see um, some of these uh, other end copies of the archives that remain there. And of course, uh, none of them are digitized and they're all in, in a script that we can't um, That's not entirely true. <laughs> okay. Um, 
the even though the website the last time I tried to was having issues, the Greek National Archive System has yeah. actually digitized a whole bunch of all these archival materials, including the Ottoman uh, archival materials that remain there. But of course, it's in Ottoman Turkish. Yeah. Um, now you'll also see uh, for Corfu, for example, which fell under English rule for a while, um, it traded hands between the Venetians, the Ottomans, the English. Um, so in Greece, you actually, for Corfu, um, you do have um, English imported civil registration um, and also other documents. And so for the Corfu State Archive, that period, those documents are in English. So you can, you know, uh, but otherwise documents are in Greek. There's uh, uh, local notaries, there's town council minutes, there's uh, some of them have some of the census registers and there's a whole bunch of uh, more materials, especially, um, so there's another level, the municipal archives in Greece, basically the basements of the town halls, which contain all the civil records for the region. And those can go back you know, to people living in the 18th century. Yeah. Um, we, we've been going an hour and a half, perhaps we should start um, wrapping up. Uh, a, a really important question, of course, from uh, Ana Paula, um, who, who says that you look like her son uh, in Portugal, and where in Portugal did your family come from? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> no, my, so we know on my, just roughly about the Moron family on my um, mother's side, that likely we descend from David or Isaac Maron, who were uh, Portuguese physicians who first uh, came to Livorno in the 1640s uh, and then moved to Izmir and joined the community thereafter. Um, those are the first people from the family who made it to uh, Livorno. Now, I must say that the Maron family of Izmir is not the Enriquez Maron of the Western Sephardi community, it's two different families. Uh, but the, they were very powerful and uh, not powerful, but very prominent in the Portuguese community. Uh, where where did they come from in Portugal? Any, For any the Moron, end? I don't know. My father's family, of course, I know because they came through Amsterdam and Rotterdam and London. And I have, you know, my family's inquisition documents on my father's side and my uh, and church uh, records from Portugal. So yes, to answer your question, Yes, I do know on some sides, yeah. on others I don't, other than generalities. Okay, she's, she's pressing Coimbra or Porto. <laughs> uh, neither. Okay, Br brilliant. Thank, 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 thank you. It's been absolutely it's a tour de force. It's incredible to, to cover such a huge period and, and such complexity um, so uh, succinctly. Tom, to, do you want to, uh, yes. to wrap up for us? Yeah. And this is exactly Thank you, Michael, for a great talk. Um, I'm sure you have to just touched um, the surface here, and there's lots and lots more to tell. Um, next week, we'll uh, discuss a subject that uh, Michael Borch, Borch, uh, Michael did uh, mention, the Alliance Israelite Universelle. We will have uh, uh, Jean-Claude Koppelmink, uh, who is the director of the Alliance, to uh, talk uh, about the Alliance and about its archives. And I am sure it will be a great talk and very interesting. And uh, as always, we are thankful to our patrons who will make all of this possible. You can become a patron too. And we provide a genealogical service and you can contact us through the email in the picture. Thank you all. Um, uh, for now, goodbye and see you next week. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.